I began the development of the Argo Jason system, which was a seven-year development to go from my dream to reality. Along the way, I was building systems and testing them. So from 1982 to 1989, I was developing a new mousetrap. I wasn't ready to do what I had designed it for, a full-fledged scientific. That takes place this August. August of 1991 is my first chance to do what I dreamed of doing 10 years ago. So, a lot, so for that 10 years, I was building my equipment and testing it. So the Titanic and the Bismarck were a part of my engineering test program. They weren't designed to, to do science. It was designed to prove I could do science. It just turned out to be what most people got interested in. But it isn't why I, I mean, I, I did not do all this to find the Titanic and the Bismarck. They were a byproduct. Now, very important to the public, but that isn't what I set out to do. I, I set out to build this to do exploration. My reason for developing the Argo Jason system was to improve my ability to explore the mountains of the sea, which I've been doing all my life. And in the process of that, I wasn't ready to take that tool down and do what I, you know, do that scientific thing, but I could do other things. So I said, well, you know, here we are at Woods Hall. We're building Argo. We've got to go and test it. And we're going to probably go out here in the deepest water that we can get to. Well, guess who's out there? The Titanic's out there. Now, if the Titanic had been in the Indian Ocean, I probably would have never found it. But the fact that it was in my backyard, I went, well, well let's, go, let's go find the Titanic. I didn't know that at the time. I mean, I knew it was a neat ship, and I didn't know that it, that it could hit this magic cord inside most humans. I, didn't, I was not aware of that. I was completely surprised by the world's response to our discovery of the Titanic. I did not expect them to go bonkers. I thought they would say, eh, you know, that's sort of neat, next. But they, they haven't given up yet. I still can't get away from finding the Titanic. It's, uh, it's going to track me to the grave. When I first set out after the Titanic, it was sort of a mechanical, technical, well, you do this, you do that, you go out and do it. It was not, my, my soul was not in it. My mind was in it. But in the course of getting ready to do it, I had to find it. And therefore, I had to study it. And I met a man by the name of Bill Tantum, who died just before I found the Titanic. And Bill was the soul of the Titanic. He lived down in Connecticut, and he started the Titanic Historical Society. He'd been injured in Korea. He always wanted to be a career army officer, but he got hurt. And it's sort of his dream went away, and he needed a new dream, and it became the Titanic. And this man lived and breathed. He was Captain Smith. When you sat and talked with him, you talked with the past. It was very uh, amazing. I just, to just get him going, you know, ask Bill a question, get him started, and then just listen. He knew how many buttons the captain had. He knew everything about it. Well, I wanted to extract from him, where is it? You know, where, what do they know? I mean, I was going after him in a very investigative reporter, but, but in the course of asking those questions, I had to listen to all this other stuff, and it infects you. It enters your soul, that tragedy. And I, it entered my soul, but I wasn't terribly conscious of that until I found it. And then I was, I was run over by an emotional truck. I was not prepared to, when I started to talk, tears come to my eyes, choke up, be almost incoherent by the event. I mean, it blew me, blew me right over, like a truck ran over the top of me. And uh, it was months that I could emotionally deal with it. I mean, it was a complete surprise. After finding the Titanic in September of 1985, I had to wait an entire year to, before I could go back. 
the longest year of my life waiting to go back for the weather window to open up. We got back out there. We went out with Alvin and our little JJ, the vehicle I wanted to send inside to investigate the Titanic. Beautiful weather. Gosh, it was gorgeous. It was in the summer season, the perfect time to dive. We went out. We had satellite navigation. We knew exactly where the Titanic was. In our we put in our tracking network. And I got into Alvin. We buttoned up, put it over the side, pull the valves or the you know vented, and down we went. And we now began to fall like a big rock for two and a half hours. We're falling towards the Titanic with all this great anticipation of for the first time seeing it, landing on its deck, tasting it, having it pop into reality from the myth that it was living in, make it real. Falling through total darkness, and then everything started to go to hell. Everything, we started to have our maiden voyage. The first thing that started to happen was the sonar stopped working. So we couldn't sweep out and find the ship. Well, that's okay because I've got my tracking and I know where uh, I am and I'll just drive over there. And the tracking went out. So now I don't know where I am. I, I, I can't reach out. All I am is a ball somewhere in the ocean with a little window. Am I a mile from the Titanic? Is it behind me? Is it in front of me? Is it right and left? And then the submarine starts to take on water into the battery systems, and the alarms start coming on. And the pilot's looking. We haven't, we haven't got sonar. We haven't got tracking. We're becoming death, dumb and blind down there. And on top of that, the submarine's taking on water, and it's penetrating into the batteries, and it's starting to short circuit the batteries. And it's just turning into a disaster. And the pilot says, look, you know, we're going to have to b abort. No, 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 come on. I've waited so long for this moment. Don't abort the dive. He said, well, I, you know, we're going to watch if it gets so much water, Bob. i got to pop it and get out of here. If we destroy the batteries, the expedition's over, and you'll never see Titanic. Well, that is pretty serious, isn't it, Ralph? So we went down, and finally, we, uh, the batteries, alarms are screaming. He's turning it down so it doesn't uh, blast in our ears, and I, the bottom comes into view. And it's just mud. And I'm sitting there, and he says, well, now what? And all that three-dimensionality of my brain is taking all this limited data. I'm looking at the currents. I'm looking at everything, and I'm going over there. Had, you know, just my brain said, it's over there. And so he brought the submarine around, and he started driving. Well, the alarms are getting worse. He said, we got minutes, Bob. we got to get out of here. Keep going. Go speed up. Go faster. Then I saw a, a clump of mud like a mud ball, like someone had a snow fight. Well, they're not supposed to be down there. And then there were a few more. I said, turn over towards those mud balls. What it was is the Titanic had hit with such force, it splued, it, it just threw mud balls everywhere. And we were seeing the splatter. And I said, follow that splatter. And the mud balls got bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally out of my window on the starboard side, there's a wall of mud, like a giant, bulldozer had just been down there bulldozing in the bottom of the ocean and I said Ralph it's right around the corner and we came around the corner and it was in my viewport there was this wall of steel like the like the slab in 2001 like the walls of Troy at night it's just big the end of the universe and it just was there as a statement. And we came in, and I just looked out of my window, which I had to look up, because the Titanic shot up a hundred and some feet above me. I'm down at the very keel. And I just went, my God. And he aborted the dive, and we were out of there. I saw it for 12 seconds. Well, the Titanic hit the iceberg April 14, 1912, at 11.40. It sank the next morning at 2.20, April 15th. And we were September 1st, so it was over 73 years that it, it had vanished.
What's interesting, when you look back into time, and sometimes there's no record, visual record, but in the in 1912, there, the early uh, movie cameras were around, but the world was black and white. And when you think of the past, you think of it as there was no color. You know, you always see the World War II movies and everyone's in black and white. And, and it sort of distances you from that. Black and white always sort of distance you. So my image of the Titanic, and even when we went back and first found it in 85, the cameras were black and white cameras. So it was still black and white. And it wasn't until I saw it in color that it zoomed from the past to the present, like a, a lightning bolt just come right at you. And there it was in today's reality. But certainly, the real thing that got me when the, when the Goosebumps were having goosebumps on goosebumps. Was when on the second dive, after we fixed the submarine, came down the next day, that's when we made love. Because we came in on the bow and landed. And it was clunk, clunk. It was like Armstrong on the moon, clunk, clunk. And you took on the 10 degree list of the submarine, of the, of the, of the Titanic. It was listing to the starboard, and you listed, and you were there, clunk, clunk. And you just sat there and, and then could say, we are on the deck of the Titanic. Oh, my God. And you just looked out the windows and just looked at it. Dramatically, in good ways and bad ways. Uh, mostly good ways. Fortunately, I think that my previous successes, although not of that scale on the Richter scale, were very good successes. I had a chance to warm up to success. I, I had done, you know, I had had that ego thing that you go through of being uh, uh, on television and, and newspapers and all of that sort of thing when the media has their meal with you. Well, I had done that on a, on a smaller scale, you know. Um, so when it, the, this big thing came, I think I had a proper frame of mind about it. You look at a lot of people who succeed, and the ones that do it overnight can ruin them. But the ones that work at it for a long while, sort of like some stars who get discovered after a 30-year career, they tend to handle it better than the people that are a star in their first movie. And I think that I'm thankful that I was prepared as much as you could be for something. I mean, it still was a, quite an experience, but I think I kept my feet on the ground through it all. And you can't take it too seriously when the spotlight, arbit to some degree, arbitrarily says, now you're famous. You say, well, I don't feel any different. And the key is don't act any different then. I think some people, you know, it's, it's one thing to climb to the top of the mountain, it's another thing to stay there. And uh, to stay there, you have to be pretty stable about it and know what you're, you know, what you're up against and, 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 and use it in a productive way. I think finding the Titanic has, has helped my career because people believe me when I say, oh, I have a new dream. And they'll say, you know, some people say, why'd you find the Bismarck? I don't know, to some degree, to prove it wasn't luck. The Bismarck was more difficult, actually, technically. But anticlimactic, not anticlimactic. I didn't expect the Bismarck to be of the Richter scale of the Titanic, but it registered pretty strong. I mean, it did, it was a great, I think the television special we created on the Bismarck, which just won the, uh, an Emmy for the best documentary, was a better film. I think the book that we did on the, tight, on the Bismarck was a better book. Uh, it was more difficult. But I accept the fact that it isn't the Titanic. But I think the fact that, you know, you want to be known for what you want to be known for. I mean, I don't want on my gravestone Bob Ballard discover the Titanic. I want Bob Ballard explore. And so I've got many years to prove that point still left ahead of me. 
And uh, the Titanic's going to help me, but I don't want to stop right now because I don't want it to say Titanic. The Bismarck helped with the momentum. It showed it wasn't luck. Uh, I've now embarked upon uh, several major programs of that ilk uh, that are now uh, being funded by National Geographic. I can't wait to get started. Uh, I'm looking into the future, not the past. I can't wait to get going on the next projects. I think of myself as an explorer. I'm very romantic. Uh, I, I grew up as a child reading stories of Marco Polo and Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and I think all through man's history there have been explorers, and a lot of people think there's no longer a, a place for them to live, and there is, particularly in the ocean. I loved uh, the travels of Marco Polo. It amazed me how he would walk, you know, maybe 30 miles a day is what a human being can walk back then. And he would go from one world to another world. And the one world he could, he could uh, go to was like Eden, you know, uh, an incredibly wonderful place. And down the road was hell. And how there was such diversity on our planet. Now you find McDonald's everywhere, but I mean, there was a, a diversity of the human species that mimicked other life. I mean, the true beauty of this planet is its diversity, not its sameness. And so Marco Polo just opened up my eyes to the diversity of the human experience. Uh, Jules Verne opened me up to the fantasies of the time machine. I loved, uh, I loved uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, uh, Captain Nemo. Captain Nemo. Uh, it was a, an adventure of, here was a person who built his own submarine using the advanced technology, then the nuclear energy before anyone even knew that it existed. Uh, so he was a technologist, but he was an adventurer. He explored beneath the sea. He had a giant window, and he saw the sea through that window, and that's exactly what I'm doing. San Diego is an incredible place to be introduced to the sea, certainly back in the, in the late 40s, early 50s. And I used to love to go down to tidal pools. What an adventure a tidal pool is. The tide comes in, covers the rocks, and then it goes away, and it traps life from the sea, and they can't get away. It's like a, a, a nature-made aquarium. And you go in there and you look around and there's fish and there's, there's, there's crabs and there's all sorts of things that then they get washed away and in the next 12 hours there'll be a new aquarium. And I love tidal pools. I also love the tide when it would come in and you'd find adventure uh, washed up on your shore like, uh, like Robinson Crusoe walking along and, and uh, seeing a, a float that had come from Japan that had crossed the Pacific Ocean, a third of our planet, and just washed up at your feet. It was so exciting. Couldn't wait to go and walk the tide line and see what treasures were waiting for me. Well, I think all kids live on the edge uh, until they're beat back from it. I see, I think all kids are born explorers. All kids are born as scientists. All kids ask why. I mean, what is it, the first dialogue you ever had with your children was, well, but why? And then you'd explain, and then, then they'd say, but, but why? And then why can take you all the way back to the origin of the universe? Uh, so I think people are born curious, and they have it pounded out of them. And, and I was in an environment that encouraged it, not discouraged it. In large part, most of the, my teachers, I was just a pain in the neck. I was full of energy. I was a bubbling vat of energy. I was hyperactive, and I was all over the place. And you know, I can be disruptive. I can be very disruptive. And so most people would rather, you know, say, you know, slow that guy down, get him out of here. But then fortunately, there's always one out of a hundred teachers who, who loves that characteristic about a person. And those are the people that always encouraged me. All through my life, I can point to someone at a critical point when I was ready to quit who said, 
keep it up, that I respect it. You're always going to be criticized if you're a doer. You have to make sure you know who to listen to. You need to pick out certain people who you have great respect for and listen to them. And I've always had those mentors uh, throughout my life, whether it was in the Navy, whether it was in business, whether it was in academia, that was it in sports that, would, that I listened to. I learned how to think. I learned how to problem solve. I learned how to bust things up and develop a logic tree. A uh, classic example was uh, someone asked me, you know, how many barbers are there in the United States? Now, how would you dissect that question? How many barbers are there in the United States? Well, it's roughly 250,000, but you can calculate it if you just run a number. Learning how to, what I call, run a number. You take the population of the United States, 250 million, you cut it in half because half are women. Then you say, how many of those would have a, you know, how many have a haircut? Well, one-year-olds don't. How many haircuts do you have uh, a, a year? Uh, how many haircuts can a barber give in a day? And before you know it, the number spits out the right answer, or doggone close. And so it was the learning how to order my thoughts, and most important, learning how to develop a plan. I think planning, I discovered the power of a plan. If you can plan it out and it seems logical to you, you can do it. And that was the secret to success. I have a f several different degrees. Uh, my undergraduate degree, actually when I went to University of California, Santa Barbara, right on the ocean, beautiful place, I took two degrees there. Uh, uh, majored in, in chemistry and geology and I minored in math and physics. So I got a very good basis in the physical sciences. And then my graduate degrees are in geology and geophysics. When I finished my undergraduate degree in 1965, I went off to graduate school at the University of Hawaii, Hawaii Institute of Geophysics. And I trained porpoises and whales as a, to make a living. I loved that. Another aspect of my life was fascinating. But then I transferred to the University of Southern California. And while at the University of Southern California, I was called into the military during Vietnam. I'd gotten an a, a Army commission and Army intelligence when I was at Santa Barbara. And then they transferred me into the, into the United States Navy. Uh, when I was at Santa Barbara, they only offered the Army. There was no other choice. Either you went into the Army ROTC program or you didn't go in at all. So I went into the Army ROTC program, but then I requested to be transferred to a more uh, to a branch of service that would utilize my skills in oceanography, and they accepted it and put me in the Navy. Woods Hall is the most incredible organization I have ever worked with. You don't work for it, you work with it. Woods Hall is the Wild West underwater, as far as I'm concerned. It's a nonprofit but private institution that when you first come here, they, they give you, they sort of put two guns to your head. One is up or out on the tenure track. You start here as a young PhD, and then after, oh, eight or 10 years, you must have made it to, to be tenured. And there's an 80% mortality, don't make it. Now, once you get tenure, which I got tenure in 1980, uh, nine years ago, they then take one gun away. But that other one there is always there, and that means you have to fund yourself. They don't fund me. I pay them to be here. I rent their flag, if you will. I, I do expeditions under their name, but I have to raise the money. So I have to be an entrepreneur. When I first came to Woods Hole, I was the Navy liaison officer. So I was a naval officer for the first three years of my 23 years at Woods Hole. After I finished my Navy career, which I thought I'd finished. I'm still, they put me back in several years ago. I'm now, I'm still a commander in the United States Navy. Uh, but I, I thought I was out in 1970, and that's when I went back to graduate school to finish my PhD and came aboard Woods Hole as a scientist. My first brush with exploration technology, believe it or not, when I was in high school, 
my, uh, my father helped me get a job at North American Aviation at a new budding group called the Ocean Systems Group. And they were bidding on a contract to, to build a submarine for the academic community. This was 1962, and that submarine was Alvin. And I was, at that point in time, I was, uh, 1962, I was 19 years old. And uh, I was able to actually work as a, as a small person in the little cog in the big, big wheel, but they were bidding on Alvin. They didn't get the contract. But that was my first introduction. That was the first time that I ever dove in a submarine, was as a naval officer here at Woods Hole. And I dove for several years in Alvin as a naval officer. And then when I left the Navy and got my doctorate, I was still in the Alvin program and continued to dive and continue to dive this, to this day. The early years of the Alvin program, which was when I was a part of it, uh, there was a lot of danger. Uh, just to get the thing to go up and down safely. The first years of deep submergence was to debug it and make it work as a system so it became routine. But in the early years, a deep dive was, there was a lot of apprehension about if everything was going to work and if you're going to come back. But as you did it over and over and over again, it became routine. But like the space shuttle, you can never lose sight of the fact that you are doing something dangerous. It may be apparently routine, but if you mess up, it'll bite you. And it has over the years. I had a fire once, not in Alvin, in a French bathyscath at 9,000 feet, almost died. I uh, crashed into the side of a volcano at 20,000 feet, almost died. I got stuck in a crack for hours, almost died. A lot of occasion. Now, I don't mean that it's really risky, awful risky, it's safer than probably flying from here to LaGuardia. I mean, those planes fall out of the sky and they crash and burn. And I suspect more people have actually died uh, per hours in airplanes than in deep submergence. Only one person has ever died in a deep submersible, only one. I used Alvin until I was convinced it, there was a better mousetrap. And that was 1980. When I was convinced, while well, I was st teaching at Stanford, uh, geophysics at Stanford, took a sabbatical. I basically got out of the submarine and decompressed. And from a career point of view, I was up for tenure. It was a crossroads in my life. And so I wanted to get out and stand back and look at it and think about it. Otherwise, I'd just keep going on without any thought. So we were starting to reach diminishing returns to some degree with our technology, that technology early diminishing returns, but it was setting in. So I said, I'm going to get out of the submarine. I'm going to not dive for a year. I'm going to go at Stanford and sit on a mountain and think about it. And I did. And that's when I dreamed up the Argo Jason system. Then I had to come back and convince someone to fund it, which is a story unto itself. It did not occur the way it's supposed to occur because Things don't occur the way they're supposed to occur. But I finally convinced a person, the Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman, that he ought to bet on me, and he did. And the Navy funded the Argo Jason system. But it was a personal, he looking in my eye, that type of person I described, who knew enough and was, I, I sent the right message to him, and he said, do it. Up until that point in time, there were a lot of things we didn't know about the ocean. We didn't know why it was salty. We didn't know why it had the chemistry that it had. If you took a bucket of the ocean and you analyzed it, and you've looked at all the chemistry inside of it, you'd say, well, how did it get this way? The most logical way was to go and take a bucket of water coming in from rivers, the most obvious way minerals are coming into the sea. The problem is when you compare a bucket of water from the ocean with a bucket of water from a major river like the Amazon, the chemistries don't make sense. And it wasn't until we found these hydrothermal springs, these underwater uh, uh, hot, hot thermal springs, did we discover that the ocean itself 
is going inside the Earth and out every six million years. The whole volume of the world's oceans actually goes inside the Earth, and we never th knew that. But once we learned that, we could finally make sense about the chemistry of the sea and make all of our equations, mass balance equations, balance for the first time. So that was exciting. Plus the animals that we found living in these hot springs turned the world upside down. We discovered the first major ecosystem ever found that lives not off the energy of the sun, but the energy of the earth itself, which completely impacts upon our thoughts about how life began on our planet, changes all those thoughts, and it changes the thoughts about the potential for life on other planets. You don't have to have a sun nearby. You can live off the energy of the planet itself. That's pretty neat. It's called chemosynthesis. Uh, a little bacteria, thermophilic bacteria, figured out how to replicate photosynthesis in the dark and fix carbon and start a food chain. They have worms that are, oh, six, eight feet tall. And if you cut them, they bleed blood like a human. Uh, really sort of gross looking things. Uh, clams that are a foot across, but when you open them, they look like liver, not clams. Uh, bizarre fish. It's like that movie where they descended into a volcano and found another world. And we, in essence, descended into a volcano and found another world, but this was real. We were the first group to ever enter the largest mountain range on our planet, the Mid-Ocean Ridge. Uh, this mountain range covers 23% of the Earth's total surface area. Almost a quarter of our planet is one mountain range, which we didn't even know, we didn't even know it existed in its totality till 1960. We had landed on the moon before we entered this mountain range on Earth, a quarter of our planet, and we did that in 1973. And I was fortunate to be one of the first human beings to go into this mountain range. Okay. You have to go down about eight to 9,000 feet to enter a deep valley. It's called the Rift Valley. And it's down inside of the mountain range itself. In the case of the Atlantic Ocean, it's called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge Rift Valley. And you enter the mountain range and you go down into this deep valley and then you come into the floor and on the floor of this valley are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of active volcanoes. And, and there are more earthquakes taking place in the adjoining fault systems of this mountain range than all the earthquakes on land by probably 10 or 100. So there's many more earthquakes going on down here than on land. There's many more volcanoes uh, belching out molten lava underneath the ocean than above but no one had ever gone down there. No one knew that, and so it was pretty exciting. They're like Hawaii, you know, you can go there and there's recent volcanoes. We have yet to observe one erupt. We know when they're erupting because we can hear them on our seismic networks. Uh, in fact, I was just talking to a scientist today to develop a rapid deployment capability to go out and observe one actually erupting but we know they erupt because we see their products uh, and there's thousands of them. Uh, fortunately, we, you know, we, we, we haven't been there when it erupted. So, uh, there was an expedition uh, recently where it erupted and the ship vanished. Oh, everyone died. So, you know, you gotta be careful. The whole objective of my science, of Earth science, is to understand the Earth. I view the Earth as a living organism. Now, it's very difficult for the you know, normal people to view the Earth as alive. And an analogy I sometimes give is if you were to interview, let's say you were interviewing a butterfly. Now, a butterfly lives, or a mayfly, lives for four or five days. And that butterfly was standing on the branch of a giant sequoia tree in California, which lives for thousands of years. And you were to ask that butterfly, do you perceive this object, this branch that you're standing on as being alive? And the butterfly would say, well, of course not. I've been here my entire life, four days, and the branch hasn't done a doggone thing. Yet when you look at the, the tree in our context or in its context, it's very much alive. It started with a seed and it grew. Well, the earth is very much like that tree and human, mankind is very much like that butterfly. If we're lucky, we'll live a hundred years. 
We're standing on a planet that was born four and a half billion years ago, looked very different when it was born. It evolved and has changed. Africa used to be just outside the window here. Morocco was, a, uh, was a connected to Cape Cod. Beneath this building are rocks from Africa. Well, it's hard to imagine them. But if you were to sit on the moon and look at the Earth and blink your eyes once every million years, it would come blossoming to life. And so what we as scientists try to do is to look at its four and a half billion year history and see it start as a child and grow up and become a young adolescent, and eventually someday the Earth will probably die, like Mars did and Venus did. But right now it's a thriving adult. And so given that view of the Earth as a living, thriving organism, our science and what we try to do underwater is to see how the Earth does its thing. And what it does in this mountain range is create its outer skin. The lithosphere, the outer crust of the planet, is created and it does it very systematically. Well, one aspect of my life, or actually it's two aspects of my life, as an explorer, you want to go and explore. But you also need the tools to explore. And in my particular field, you can't go down to Sears and Roebuck and buy them. They're not General Motors doesn't build my robots. Uh, I have to develop my own tools myself. So half of my life is exploring, and the other half is building tools to do it better the next time. Uh, for example, when I first came to Woods Hole uh, as a naval officer in 1967, uh, I was assigned to the deep diving program, and they had a little submarine called Alvin that had just got here. The major innovations that we have developed is to move away from manned exploration to teleoperated exploration or remote presence. You know, there's always been this debate in space about do you send an astronaut or do you send a, 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 an unmanned space probe? We say that you want to send a hybrid of both. It's not manned and it's not unmanned. A teleoperated system is a robot controlled on a minute by minute, second by second basis by a human being but the human isn't physically there. When you dive down to the bottom of the ocean, the average depth of the ocean is 12,000 feet. 50% is deeper, 50% is shallower. The Titanic, for example, sits at 12,000 feet. Now, when I was diving on the Titanic, it took me two and a half hours to get to the Titanic in the morning and two and a half hours to get home at night. I had to commute five hours a day to work and I was only allowed to work for three hours before I had to go back up. So it was like a, a diver, a sponge diver, taking a breath of air, running down, doing some work before their lungs burst, run back up. But then they developed the scuba tank and you could go down and stay down. Well, what we've done is to develop robots that can go down and stay down. And they're connected by a, a fiber optic tether to humans somewhere else. And that permits us to explore 24 hours a day. And that's been my major technological contribution, is to develop the first full remotely operated robotic systems for deep sea exploration. I'll never forget that day. Uh, you know, sub deep submersibles were evolving as a technology, but they hadn't been accepted yet. The geophysical community, the big gurus, uh, viewed it as a toy, a plaything that really couldn't possibly do anything important because it hadn't done anything important up to that point. Any new technology hasn't done anything until it does something. And I remember that the National Academy of Science, which is a pretty highfalutin outfit, had a meeting in Princeton in the early 19, I think it was 1971 or two, to, to take a review of where we were in understanding our planet. The plate tectonic theory had just blasted all over the, over the countryside. It was exciting. But they, they needed an, a new phase, and a higher detail. And I remember I was a graduate student, and K.O. Emery, my mentor, had me present to this august body. Very scary. My knees were knocking. These were all the big gods of the Earth. And I had to go, and I don't know if you've ever been to Princeton, but they have the old classrooms that are like an 
operating pit. You stand down there and you look up and it's sort of intimidating. And I got done and a very preeminent scientist, very preeminent, I don't want to say who he is because he's still very preeminent, stood up and said, that's eh, cute, but tell me one significant thing a man submersible has ever done. Well, there, I went. And I, w I didn't have an answer. And I was standing there frozen and another colleague stood up and he said, it isn't the problem, the technology's not at fault. We haven't dreamed of a way of using it. And out of that came Project Famous and the first manned expedition. Man submersibles are a part of a total thing. And that's what we had to work on. We had to, you can't run around the planet with a man submersible with a flashlight. It'll take us thousands of years. You have to go to just the right spot where the question is very important. And if you can answer the question there, it explains thousands and thousands of square miles of real estate. And that's what we had to learn how to do, how to focus that technology on the right spot. Salesmanship is a critical part of accomplishments anywhere in any field. You have to look them in the eye and not blink when you say you can do it. They have to look at you. A really good leader, a really good manager, a good decision maker doesn't know the details, doesn't really know, can't necessarily follow a specialist through their labyrinth of explanations. But what they really do is they listen, they get a feeling about whether that person is educated and knows what they're, they know how to do that. But ultimately they have to look the person in the eye and say, I think this person can do it. So you must be able to transmit to them through body language, through whatever, that you're confident, you've thought it out, you know what you're going to do and you'll take the risks professionally and your neck when I do something my necks on the line more than anyone else and the more you build your reputation the more they know how much you're putting at risk he wouldn't do this if he didn't think he could do it now clearly the first time is difficult because they don't have any track record they say, well, who is this person when I gave this presentation but we went and we did it and then we went and did another one and then we went and did another one and finally, the reputation you build up is when he says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. Geologists had learned how to map on land. They learned how to, to do their thing, mapping the, that part of the planet that sticks above water, and they'd been doing it for hundreds of years, and they had perfected it, and it's called field mapping. It's the science of mapping on land. But no one had ever taken that art form, which it really is, and applying it underwater in a totally different planet. When you go underneath the sea, you are going to another planet that is more hostile than Mars and the moon. You can't get out. You can't walk around. The pressures will kill you. The temperatures are freezing, and it's totally dark. It's a lot easier to walk around on, on the moon and work than it is down there. So you had to take that way of, of doing things and marineize it and make it work underwater so that people were comfortable with the quality of the data you were collecting. And that's what I did. I, I was the first scientist to field map underwater. Fortunately, I can visualize uh, three-dimensionally. I think any good field mapper can look at a map and see the Grand Canyon in three dimensions. You can conceptualize because you can't see more than 30 feet, 40 feet under the ocean. So you must have a complete sense of reference. And I don't know whether that's a gift, a compass that someone built into your brain, like a bird's ability to migrate. I can know where north, south, east, and west is at all times. I can remember where I was and I can integrate it all in my mind. So when I go down there, I'm not lost. I'm very comfortable in total darkness with just a flashlight. And uh, it's like working in the Rocky Mountains at night in a snowstorm from a helicopter with a spotlight. And can you do it? You can develop that skill set. Certain sets of people have that three-dimensional skill set.
Angus was the first vehicle I built with staying power. Fundamentally, I'm an observational scientist. I look, I think about what I look at, and I explain it. I'm an observational scientist. I'm not a numerical scientist, although I use numbers. I'm basically relying on the Mark I eyeball. 65% of your brain processes visual information, so you're a visual creature. And so I'm a scientific application of that visual creature. I use it as a science. I look and I try to think about what I see and explain it. So when you're down under the ocean, you must have a, a it's basically, imagine uh, standing on the moon and beginning a trip towards a small object in this mountain range. So first you see the earth, and then you see the continents, and then you see the ocean, then the, you go under the ocean, you see a mountain range, and you're homing in. You have to have all of the te technologies that can zoom in and not get lost each time you change the power on the microscope. You make that transition so that but finally, when you get down there in total darkness and you're looking out your window, you know exactly where on the planet you are and why that is a key thing to look at. And that's what I do. Because I'm a visual creature, Angus was a capability that could initially give me massive images. Now, initially, it was sort of a wind-up toy. You, you wound up this camera, so to speak. I had a lot of them. You know, I could take 16,000 photographs at one lowering, and I would drop it down, and then for 12 to 14 hours, I would tow it through the valley, bring it up, process all the film, and then look at all the pictures. And all those images were my windows into the deep sea. But it was frustrating because the vehicle didn't have any intelligence. It just took pictures. If I came across something that was really important, I didn't know about it until 14 hours later. So the vehicle just kept going and took awful pictures that weren't much uh, of value. That's why I developed Argo, which was give it to me now. I want it real time. I want to make decisions now. Science is very much like the game of Clue. Remember that? The butler did it in the, in the library with the candlestick. And the game of Clue was to get the answer with the minimum amount of clues, and that was the winner. Clues are expensive in science. To get clues costs money. And scientists are finite resources. Can you figure it out with the minimum number of clues, i.e., the minimum amount of time and money? Can you get the answer? So we want to optimize our clue gathering. So when we put our robot down, we want to be thinking, no, 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 stop, turn left. Not turn right, and we want to be in charge because we don't want to just take a massive look. We want to just do a surgical look and, and get the treasure. It's sort of like Dungeons and Dragons. Get in there and find the treasure box and open it before anyone else can, and that's the game. With Argo, see, I, don't, I have two advantages over uh, uh, Alvin and Angus. Alvin, I had to get inside of and make this journey and work for three hours with no friends along to say, well, what do you think? You know, no person knows everything. You need your team to say, well, I don't, I don't know that one, but I know that one. Do you know that one? That whole converse, conversation that takes place between scientific colleagues where each of you have a specialization, you can help one another solve a problem. No person can solve a problem alone. You need help if it's a good problem. If it's, it's a, if it's worth solving, it, takes, it needs help. You need help. Okay. So you want that help all around you. And you can't get them in the sphere. They don't fit inside the submarine. So you have to go back and explain things. Well, you know, and it's very time-consuming, very inefficient. But if you can have your window, basically what I did is I built a window up on the surface where I could bring all my friends and we could look through the window. So what do you think? So I also could not only have a lot of people looking through the window with me, I could look through the window 24 hours a day. And it was cheaper, and it was more comfortable. I had big computers, I had charts, I had all sorts of things at my disposal. I had a library behind me to, to go and look for facts real quick if I was stumped. I had a video archive. I could call up images and say, yeah, that's it. You can't cram that inside a little submarine. 
The other thing was were Angus. Angus couldn't react in real time. There was a big lag. Argo does the both. It has the staying power of Angus, but it has the human presence of the submarine. So you can sit there and at that, you're going along, you're going along, and, and you're just about to lose it, and you go, turn. And you control the robot, and you get it back on track. So it's very efficient. The problem is it's a monster of data. It works 24 hours a day, and you, you have to fall asleep. You have to go sleep. So you have to de devise a team that can work together so there's a corporate memory, so that you, you don't repeat one another. And that's the excitement we're in now. How do you handle a machine that's like uh, uh, the one in 2001, Harold? How, how, how? how do you handle something that's almost getting smarter than you are? We're there. We're there. Our machines are, 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 are working harder than we are, and, and there's a human element of frailty that they don't have. They don't sleep. I do. They're impatient machines. They say, get up. Wake up. I got all sorts of things I want to talk to you about. I have so many things I want to do. Uh, I have my own company that builds robots. I want, to, I want to be a successful businessman. So you only come on this planet once. And so I'm trying to live six or seven lives simultaneously, just in case <laughs> you don't get to come back. Uh, so I, I like all aspects of, of, of life. I love uh, writing. I just did my first uh, spy thriller. Comes out, that was a lot of fun. It comes out next year. I started doing children's books because I love children. We did the Jason Project for kids. Uh, I'm still a naval officer. I'm very proud of that. Uh, I just recently got married, and I'm all excited about that. All sorts of things. There's a million things to do. I lost my boy. I think that. Uh, you know, right when things are going great, you're going to get zinged. And uh, I couldn't have been at a higher point in my life when I found the Bismarck. Actually, higher than the Titanic, because I'd found the Titanic already. So I sort of was able to add. It was a, that was a big, a big point, but I was at, able to add to that point to then have my boy die, who had been with me for three years at sea. And I went to the bottom. He died in a car accident. A simple, he'd been with me in the tough, dangerous settings. He worked the deck in storms where a father wants to not let his son be out there, but he can't say that because he's got to be out there with everyone else and to just be terrified that he was going to get injured in the heavy seas, heavy equipment. And, and then to have that all behind you and take a sigh of relief that he's no longer at risk and then they have him die the next week and when you weren't looking when you weren't ready, is devastating. And then to try to, to, uh, to make that a positive experience for you. Certainly not for him, but to make the most out of your son's death is a big challenge. It's hopefully getting a little easier, but you know it's funny how people will say, I don't think you can do that. Nah, then you do it and they say, that was great. And you say, well, I got this another. No, I don't think you can do that. And you say, wait a minute. I are we back where we were? And so you do it again. And in some ways, there's a burden. I mean, when I said I was going to find the Titanic, no one believed it. When I said I was going to find the Bismarck, everyone believed it. And, and then I didn't the first year. I failed my first attempt at finding the Bismarck. So there's this relationship with succeeding to where people expect you to succeed and yet they still don't believe. They expect you to succeed, but they don't, they don't want to stick their own necks out on it. And so risk-taking can be very lonely at times. And you know that classic saying, which is very true, uh, failure is an orphan, but success has many fathers. And I'll tell you, when I'm greatest at risk, it's, I look around and there are not a whole lot of people there. But as soon as I succeed, boy howdy, they're there. They said, we were always there. And I said, yeah, about 500 miles behind me. 
So you have to live to learn, you have to learn to accept that. You have to know that when it gets dicey and there's a lot on the line, you're gonna find out who your friends are, not at the party afterwards. A failure causes you to rethink everything. A massive failure causes you to rethink everything. But if you thought it out right in the first place, when you review the logic that sets you off down that path, you say, well, that's pretty good logic. So I just, you know, I better keep going. I always said to my son before he died, I said, if you stay in the game, it's never over. It may be just a bad inning. But if you don't quit, you can't lose. You only lose when you quit. I say, hang in there and you'll succeed. And I'm convinced that if you can think it out and dream it, you can do it. And now it's just a question of how hard you want to do it. And what life does is test your determination. And that's the important thing. Don't give up. And guess what? You'll make it. I think you have to build confidence. I think most important, you have to like yourself. Not be egotistic about it, but come to grips with yourself. You know, most of the time you're growing up, people tell you what's wrong with you. The coach tells you, your parents tell you, the teachers tell you, they grade you. All through your early part of your life, you're being, don't touch this, don't do that, you know, this and that. And you can develop a, gosh, what sort of clumsy, awful person am I? Because everyone's telling me, you know, what's wrong with me. And I think that that's good in the early stages because it helps you then develop those skills. But at some point in your career, generally I think when you're in your teens, it's set by then. You look in a mirror and you have to say, despite all the bumps and warts, I like that person I'm looking at. And let's just do our best. And that's that point where you then start to take what's good about you and polish it into a, into a polished apple. I think everyone is unique. We know that. And what they have to do is first find out what it is. And the only way you find out what you are is by trying everything. And then you start to find out what you are. And then at some point you take what you are, which is unique. Don't ever try to mimic anybody because you'll only be second best. You can never outshine the thing you're trying to mimic. So don't ever do that. Don't idol worship. Finally, be yourself and then you're going to be really unique and exciting and people are going to be the path to your door if you polish your inner self. I think uh, Joseph Campbell summarized life. Life is the act of becoming. You never arrive. I mean, people plan a, a, a lifetime to climb Mount Everest, and they only stay up there five minutes. It isn't the view they're after. It's the fact they made it. It was the act of becoming. And that's where you learn about life, you learn about yourself, and the only way you're going to discover that is to try. And I always say to a kid, look, if you scale a mountain a thousand feet high and fall off of it, you're going to break your neck. So scale one a hundred thousand feet high. It's still, you know, you're gonna, if you fall off it, you're going to break your neck. I believe that it's just as difficult to do something easy as to do something difficult. You get up in the morning, you put on your pants, and you, and you work till you go to bed at night. And so shoot for a big one. There's no added risk in shooting for a tall mountain. But what's so beautiful about a tall mountain is when you get to the top of it, you can see over all the other smaller mountains and you can see these other peaks. And the most exciting thing about success is being able to meet the people on those other peaks and learn how they got there. And you find how common it was to get to the top of their peak, whether it's in the arts or the sciences or in sports, it's still the climbing process. So what's very important is there isn't any specific mountain that's unique. Don't spend all your time trying to figure out which big mountain. Pick 
the closest one, and climb it. I'm excited about my marriage. I'd say that's the most important mountain, probably the tallest of all. And again, I revert back to uh, Joseph Campbell. Uh, a person as an individual can only scale mountains so high. The man species sees the world through a particular set of eyes. The woman sees it through a different set of eyes. It's like binocular vision. You can't see the world in stereo without both views. Slightly different, both valid, that collectively show the world as you can never see through one eye. And so to find your other half, that's what your mate is all about, to find your other half. And I've been lucky and done that. And now I want to see the world through that binocular view. And so I want to know what she thinks about everything, because the truth in between. What came out of the Titanic experience, like so many things that changed my life, up until finding Titanic, I didn't get a lot of letters from kids when I found volcanoes and hydrothermal systems. I did well in the scientific community, but I was not flooded by letters from kids. The day I found the Titanic is the day I started having a thousands and thousands of pen pals of kids all around the world. Our book on the Titanic came out in 11 countries. And what we discovered was a fascination in, in high-tech adventure. At a time when children were dropping out of real science, not taking physics, not taking math, America's scientific literacy was plummeting. We're now 17th in scientific literacy in just the Western world. And so we saw an opportunity to, to, why were kids writing me letters if they didn't like science? I'm a scientist. What I do is science. I need to communicate that to them. And what's exciting about what I do is the moment of discovery. Unfortunately, you can't take kids down your submarine or out on your ships in large quantities. So we devised a project called the Jason Project. What we did is, remember that I'm in an imaginary submarine at sea. I'm not down there, my robots are. Well, if I think I'm down there in my room, what if I built identical rooms and put them all over the North America and connected them by satellite? That means if a child entered one of these other rooms, they'd see what I see when I see it. So I built 12 of them. And I went to teachers and I said, give me your students and bring them into this room and I'll take them on the expedition. And we signed up. 250,000 kids and we made the kids promise that they couldn't get in the room unless they promised to study science for four months. We wrote a curriculum, a tough one, in the physical sciences where they're not studying math and physics and chemistry, the languages of science, robotics, telecommunications, and they studied it. Had no problem. They wanted to get in that room. So you have to think that of math as a, as a, as a wind sprints. When I played college basketball, I'd practice for two hours, and the coach would say, just as I wanted to go to the locker room, I was dead. He'd say, give me 20 wind sprints. And I wanted to do 20 wind sprints. And he would say, but do you want to play in tomorrow's game? Yeah, well, then you better do 20 wind sprints. And I did those 20 wind sprints, which gave me the stamina to survive four quarters of basketball. Well, math is mental wind sprints. And you'll never sell a kid on mental wind, sp wind sprints. You got to sell them on the game. Then they'll do the wind sprints. So what we wanted to do is to show them what excitement exploration is. And sell them on exploration, on the, on the quest for knowledge. Sell them on that and how exciting it is and rewarding it is. And when you hook them, then they'll go prepare themselves. And so every year we mount an expedition somewhere in the world this coming year, we're going to go to the Galapagos Islands. And the kids will go there live through our technology base. But they don't get to go unless they study science. And it's working. Lehigh University has joined the Jason Network, their school of education, and they're tracking the kids and asking them the questions and seeing. And we discovered that the excitement of exploration has no sex. It's exciting to boys as it is to girls. And that the most formative 
point in a child's mind about science is between grades six through 10. And uh, we're having an impact long before college. The game's over before they take their sats. It's over. We've got the greatest university system in the world, but one of the worst pre-university systems in the world. And then we want to change that. And we are.